in the previous lecture, we discussed the potential issues that we may have with the simplex algorithm, and we saw that we may have a problem with initialization. All the steps of the simplex algorithm were performed assuming that we start with some initial basic feasible solution, and uh, as our initial basic variables, we just used the slack variables in the previous examples. However, as we already mentioned, we may have a problem with that. Let's say we have a linear program like this, and uh, we have this dictionary that we previously used as initial dictionary. The only reason we were able to actually use it as the initial feasible dictionary was the fact that all these BIs were non-negative. However, we also mentioned some examples where the right-hand sides are not necessarily positive, like in this example, we have a negative right-hand side with less than or equal to inequality, another negative right-hand side here. So when we introduce the slack variable for the first constraint, for example, we have negative 5 here. So if we set all the non-basic variables to 0, then as a result, we will obtain x4 equal to minus 5, and we cannot have negative values for the variables. So remember, uh, one of the key assumptions is that all the variables are always non-negative when we consider the simplex algorithm for linear programs. So let's consider another example where we added an extra constraint, the manufacturing constraint to the heavenly pouch problem. So here we are required to manufacture at least 100 slings. So this is the minimum order. As a result, when we try to set up this LP in the standard form after introducing the slack and excess variables, we see that setting the non-basic variables x1 and x2 to 0 will result in E5 equal to minus 100, so which is not acceptable, obviously. So somehow we need to overcome this problem in order to get an initial basis. Let's see how we can do this. One potential solution is to introduce the so-called artificial variable. So this was the fifth constraint of this last example that we considered. The reason we cannot use the excess variable as our basic variable for this constraint is because the sign is not what we want here, right? So it's negative. If it was a plus, then we would have E5 equal 100, and uh, this would be fine, right? However, the sign is negative, and uh, we cannot use this variable directly as the basic variable here. But why don't we introduce a new variable, like uh, some artificial variable A5, and use it with the sign that will work? So in this case, if you use plus A5, then, you know, by setting all the remaining variables to zero, we'll have A5 is equal to 100, and uh, this works as uh, a basic variable then. However, the problem is that by introducing this artificial variable, we may actually violate the constraint that we have. So the correct constraint was this one. And uh, when we add A5, if we use A5, which is not 0, then this constraint here will be violated. All right, so this artificial variable works as the basic variable for this constraint but only assuming that eventually this variable A5 will be forced to become zero, okay? So when we introduce this artificial variable, of course, we assume that the artificial variable is non-negative, like all other variables that we have in LP. And A5 equal to zero is the lowest value this variable can actually have. Right? So we cannot have a negative value, so 0 is the lowest you can go. Therefore, somehow we need to minimize the value of the variable A5 and make sure that A5 will eventually become 0. And when A5 is equal to 0, then this constraint will become exactly equivalent to the original constraint. Therefore, the original constraints will be satisfied we will consider two different approaches for ensuring that this artificial variable A5 is eventually zero whenever the original problem is feasible. In the first approach, what we'll do, we'll explicitly minimize 
this A5 here, or whenever I have more than one constraint for which I need to introduce the artificial variable, I'll minimize the sum of all the artificial variables, and I want to make sure that the minimum will be equal to zero. So the minimum objective is equal to zero, which is only possible when all the artificial variables are equal to zero, and this is exactly what I'm trying to achieve here. I need to make sure that all artificial variables are equal to zero. Therefore, we'll write down the corresponding problem where we explicitly minimize the sum of AIs, and uh, we'll have all the constraints listed as in the original problem, plus we'll add all of these artificial variables that we needed, right? So we'll solve that problem, and then if we get a zero solution as the optimal solution for this problem, then it means that we'll be able to find a feasible solution for the original problem. If we are not able to find the, an optimal solution that has the value of zero in the objective, then this will mean that the original problem was infeasible. The other approach that we'll use, instead of minimizing this sum explicitly, we'll try to penalize the non-zero values for artificial variables by adding these artificial variables to the objective with particular coefficients that will penalize having non-zero values for artificial variables. I will illustrate both of these approaches on the same example. So let's consider the following problem. All right, so we have the problem of maximizing x1 minus 2x2 plus 3x3 subject to three constraints here. The first two constraints are in the greater than or equal to form. The third one is in the less than or equal to form. So the first step that we take, we convert this LP in the standard form by introducing the excess and slack variables. We have excess variable for the first constraint and for the second constraint, and then we have the slack variable for the third one. And as we see, in two out of three constraints here, we have a problem with using the excess variables as our initial basic variables, right? So in particular, for minus x4 equal to 12, we would have negative value for x4, and then minus x5 equal to 6, we would have a negative value for x5. So therefore, we'll have to introduce artificial variables for these two constraints here. So we'll have plus a1 here and plus a2, okay? Now, what we want to do next is we want to ensure that a1 and a2 are both equal to zero. So one way to do it could be to ignore this objective for a moment and instead have the objective of minimizing a1 plus a2, okay? So if we minimize a1 plus a2, then because both variables a1 and a2 are non-negative, so a1, a2 are greater than or equal to zero, the minimum possible value that we can get for the objective would be zero, right? So, and uh, we want to actually get the objective down to zero, because otherwise the original problem would be infeasible. Why is it the case? So let's say I'm, I'm minimizing a1 plus a2, right? So And uh, there are two possibilities, right? So the first possibility is that the minimum value for a1 plus a2 is zero, in which case both a1 and a2 must be equal to zero. And whenever both a1 and a2 are zeros, it means that this part just uh, disappears here, right? And uh, what will remain, the values for x's that we'll get in this solution will actually be a feasible solution for the original LP. And then we can use this feasible solution for the original LP as a starting point for solving the problem. So this will give a rise to what we call the two-phase simplex method, where on the first phase we solve this auxiliary problem, and on the second phase we use the solution to this auxiliary problem as the initial solution for the second phase where we'll solve the LP. Now, the second approach that we'll consider before we go into details of the two-phase simplex method 
The second approach will be to penalize non-zero values for A1 and A2 by introducing them in the objective with some large negative coefficients, okay? So what we'll do, we have a maximization problem, right? And um, what we'll do, we'll subtract the sum of A1 and A2 with some large coefficient that will denote by big M. So this is what we call uh, the big M problem. The big M sounds cool. Could be a perfect nickname for someone named Maximum. Big M is a constant which we can assume to be plus infinity. So this essentially is as large positive number as you want if A1 or A2 is greater than zero, then obviously multiplying this positive number by plus infinity will essentially give you plus infinity here. Then you subtract infinity from whatever your objective is, and as a result, you will get minus infinity in the objective. With sufficiently large M, and we can assume M to be as large as we want, we will not allow any positive values for A1 or A2 whenever it is possible. Because using positive values for A1 and A2 will immediately take you to minus infinity in the objective. So this is a very severe penalty that we have for non-zero values of A1 and A2. And essentially you get A1 or A2 positive in solving this problem whenever having A1 and A2 both equal to zero is just impossible. And when is it impossible? This means that the original problem was infeasible, right? So because if the original problem is feasible, then you have the assignment for x1, x2, x3, and x4, 5, and 6, such that by setting a1 and a2 to 0, this system will be satisfied, right? So but if a1 and a2 cannot be 0, then it means that we cannot find the set of x's such that the original system would be feasible. We have very tight connections here between the original LP, then the auxiliary problem that we mentioned before, and the big M problem that we just wrote here. All right, let's look at um, the auxiliary and big M problem together one more time. So what was the auxiliary problem? Instead of maximizing the original objective function, we decided to minimize the sum of A1 and A2, right? And then minimizing the sum of A1 and A2 is the same thing as maximizing the negative of A1 plus A2, which is minus A1 minus A2, all right? So it's the same problem, but presented as a maximization problem so that this is the type of problems that we considered in all examples. So, but obviously, if I have a problem of minimizing any objective, I can convert it into a problem of maximizing by just multiplying the objective function by minus one, uh, which is what we did here. All right, so, and then the big M problem associated with the same LP, it actually uses the original objective here, but we penalize non-zero A1 and A2 by subtracting these terms here. So now, the property of the auxiliary problem is that whenever the original LP is feasible, it means that I can set A1 and A2 to zero. It's essentially the same as eliminating A1 and A2. And if I eliminate them, then this will be just the system for the original LP. And whenever it is feasible, with A1 and A2 equal to zero, the system is satisfied, right? And uh, this means that the optimal objective for our auxiliary problem will be what? Zero. Now, how about the case if the problem is infeasible? So if the problem is infeasible, it means that I cannot actually have A1 and A2 both equal to zero at the same time. Since the problem is infeasible, with A1 and A2 equal to zero, I cannot satisfy the system, right? Therefore, my objective will actually be negative in this case. 
all right so we'll have positive a1 and a2 and the objective will be negative or non-zero right essentially auxiliary problem has the optimal objective value of zero if and only if the original lp is feasible therefore we can use this auxiliary problem solve it and uh, if the optimal solution has a value different than zero then we conclude that the original problem was infeasible so this is the answer the original problem is infeasible otherwise if we show that the optimal objective value for the auxiliary problem is zero, then we can eliminate A1 and A2 because they're zeros and uh, use the basic variables for optimal solution in the auxiliary problem as the initial basic variables for our second phase. And in the second phase, we'll go back to the original objective, we'll express all the basic variables and when I say basic variables these are the basic variables in the optimal solution of the auxiliary problem so we'll express all the basic variables in the objective through the non-basic variables and this will start phase two so we got the starting basis that works and then we proceed with the steps of the simplex algorithm as usual In the big M method, instead of breaking things down into two phases, we do everything in one phase. The only difference compared to how we have done uh, the simplex steps previously is that we have these big M coefficients here. 